Good evening. Thank you for gathering with cultural expressions this evening. It is indeed my pleasure, my joy, my privilege, my distinct honor to be able to present to you this evening a great male literary voice in America. Many of you may be familiar with this author for one of his numerous works. The autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman comes easily to mind. A Gathering of Old Men, In My Father's House, Bloodline of Love and Dust, and of course his most recent work, A Lesson Before Dying. Ladies and gentlemen, it is your privilege and honor as well to share with me this evening with Mr. Ernest J. Gaines. Would you please welcome him? Since I'll start from the beginning of the book, I don't think there's any need for an introduction to it. I'll start with chapter one and read a couple of chapters. And then uh, I suppose if you have questions, I'll try to answer the questions. But we'll start with um, <clears throat> chapter one, a lesson before dying. And um, go from there. What I need to say, I think, about this is that uh, <clears throat> the story takes place in Louisiana, as all of my stories do. And um, the year is 1948, and some things have changed. I'm going to put this water up here because it'll be difficult to get back there and get it each time I need some water. This time. Okay, chapter one of <clears throat> A Lesson Before Dying. I was not there, yet I was there. No, I did not go to the trial. I did not hear the verdict because I knew all the time what it would be. Still, I was there. I was there as much as anyone else was there. Either I sat behind my aunt and his godmother, or I sat beside them. Both are large women, but his godmother is larger. He's of average height, 5'4", five, 5'5", five, five, but weighs nearly 200 pounds. Once she and my aunt had found their places, two rows behind the table where he sat with his court-appointed attorney, his godmother became as immobile <clears throat> as a great stone or as one of our oaks. Osiris stumps. She never got up once to get water or go to the bathroom down in the basement. She just sat there staring at the boy's clean crop head where he sat at the front table with his lawyer. Even after he had gone to await the jurors' verdict, her eyes remained in that one direction. She heard nothing said in the courtroom, not by the prosecutor, not by the defense attorney, not by my aunt. Oh, yes. She did hear one word, one word for sure, hog. It was my aunt whose eyes followed the prosecutor as he moved from one side of the courtroom to the other, pounding his fist into the palm of his hand, pounding the tables where his papers lay, pounding the rail that separated the jurors from the rest of the courtroom. It was my aunt who followed his every move, not his godmother. She was not even listening. She had gotten tired of listening. She knew, as we all knew, what the outcome would be, that a white man had been killed 
during the robbery, and though two of the robbers had been killed on the spot, one had been captured, and he too would have to die. Though he told them no, he had nothing to do with it, that he was on his way to the White Rabbit Bar and Lounge when Brother and Bear drove up beside him and offered him a ride. And after he got into the car, they asked him if he had any money. When he told them he didn't have a solitary dime, it was then that Brother and Bear started talking credits, saying that old Rope should not mind crediting them a pint since he knew them well. And he knew that the grinding season was coming soon and they would be able to pay him back then. The store it was uh, empty except for the old storekeeper, Al C. Grope, who sat on a stool behind the counter. He spoke first. He asked Jefferson about his godmother. <clears throat> Jefferson told him that Nan was all right. Old Grope nodded his head. You tell her for me, I say hello, he told Jefferson. He looked at Brother and Bear, but he did not like them. He didn't trust them. Jefferson could see that in his face. What do for you boys, he asked. A bottle of that apple white there, Mr. Grope, Bear said. Old Grope got the bottle off the shelf, but he did not set it on the counter. He could see that the boys had already been drinking. He became suspicious. You boys got money? He asked. Brother and Bear, spread out all the money they had in their pockets on top of the counter. Old Grope counted it with his eyes. That's not enough, he said. Come on now, Mr. Grope, they pleaded with him. Now you know you're gonna get your money as soon as the grinding start. No, he said. Money is slack everywhere. You bring the money, you get your wine. He turned to put the bottle back on the, on the shelf. One of the boys, the one called Bear, started around the counter. And you stop there, Grope told him, go back. Bear had been drinking, and his eyes were glossy. He walked and stared at it, grinning all the time as he continued around the counter. Go back, Grope told him. I mean the last time, now you go back. Bear grinned and continued. Grope moved quickly toward the cash register where he withdrew a revolver and started shooting. Soon, they were shooting from another direction. When it was quiet again, Bear, Grope, and Brother were all down on the floor, and only Jefferson was standing. He wanted to run, but he couldn't run. He couldn't even think. He didn't know where he was. He didn't know how he had gotten there. He couldn't remember ever getting into the car. He couldn't remember a thing he had done all day. He heard a voice calling. He thought the voice was coming from the liquor shelves. Then he realized that old Grope was not dead and that it was he was calling. He made himself go to the end of the counter. He had to look across there to see the storekeeper. Both lay between the counter and the shelves of alcohol. Several bottles had been broken and alcohol and blood covered their bodies as well as the floor. He stood there gaping at the old man slumped against the bottom shelf of gallons and half gallons of wine. He didn't know whether he should go to him or whether he should run out of there. The old man continued to call, boy, boy, boy. Jefferson became frightened. The old man was still alive. He had seen him. He would tell on him. Now he started babbling. It wasn't me. It wasn't me, Mr. Grope. It was brother and bear. A brother shot you. It wasn't me. They made me come over there. You got to tell the law that Mr. Grope. You hear me, Mr. Grope? But he was talking to a dead man now. Still, he did not run. He didn't know what to do. He didn't believe that this had happened. Again, he couldn't remember how he had gotten there. He didn't know whether he had come there with Brother and Bear or whether he had walked in and seen all this after it happened. He looked from one dead body to the other. He didn't know whether he should call someone on the telephone or run. He had never dialed a telephone in his life, but he had seen other people use them. He didn't know what to do. He was standing by the liquor shop and suddenly he realized he needed a drink and he needed it badly. He snatched the bottle off the shelf, wrung off the cap, and turned up the bottle all in one continuous motion. The whiskey burned him like fire, his chest, his belly, his nostrils. His eyes watered. He shook his head to clear his mind. Now he began to realize where he was. Now he began to realize fully what had happened. Now he knew he had to get out of there. He turned. 
He saw the money in the cash register under the little wire clamps. He knew taking money was wrong. His nanny had told him never to steal. He didn't want to steal, but he didn't have a solitary dime in his pocket. And nobody was around, so who could say he stole it? Surely not one of the dead men. He was halfway across the room, the money stuffed inside his jacket pocket, a half bottle of whiskey clutched in his hand when two white men walked into the store. That was his story. The prosecutor's story was different. The prosecutor argued that Jefferson and the other two had gone there with the full intention of robbing the old man and then killing him so that he could not identify them. When the old man and the other two robbers were all dead, this one it proved the kind of animal he really was. Stuffed the money into his pockets and celebrated the event by drinking over their still bleeding bodies. The defense argued that Jefferson was innocent of all charges except being at the wrong place at the wrong time. There was absolutely no proof that there had been a conspiracy between himself and the other two. The fact that Mr. Groby shot only brother and bear was proof of Jefferson's innocence. Now why did Mr. Groby shoot one boy twice and not shoot at Jefferson once? Because Jefferson was merely an innocent bystander. He took this whiskey to calm his nerve, not to celebrate. He took the money out of hunger and plain stupidity. Gentlemen of the jury, look at this. This. This boy. I almost said man, but I can't say man. For sure he has reached the age of 21 when we civilized men. Consider the male species has reached manhood, but would you call this, this, this a man? No, not I. I would call it a boy and a fool. A fool is not aware of right and wrong. A fool does what others tell him to do. A fool got into that automobile. <clears throat> a man with a modicum of intelligence would have seen that those racketeers meant no good, but not a fool. A fool got into that automobile. A fool rode to that grocery store. A fool stood by and watched this happen, not having the sense to run. General of the jury, look at him. Look at him. Look at this. Do you see a man sitting here? Do you see a man sitting here? I ask you, I implore, look carefully. Do you see a man sitting here? Look at the shape of this skull. This face as flat as the palm of my hand. Look deeply into those eyes. Do you see a modicum of intelligence? Do you see anyone here who could plan a murder, a robbery, can plan, can plan, can plan anything? A cornered animal to strike quickly out of fear, a trait inherited from the, his ancestors in the deepest jungle of blackest Africa, oh yes, yes, that he can do. But to plan, to plan, gentlemen of the jury, no gentlemen, this skull, he holds no plans. What you see here is a thing that acts on command. A thing to hold the handle of a plow. A thing that loads your bales of cotton. A thing to dig your ditches, to chop your wood, to pull your corn. Now that's what you see here. But you do not see anything capable of planning a robbery or a murder. He does not even know the size of his clothes or his shoes. You ask him to name the months of the year. Ask him, does Christmas come before or after Fourth of July? Mention the name of Keats, Byron, Scott, and see whether the eyes will show one moment of recognition. Ask him to describe a rose, to quote one passage from the Constitution or the Bill of Rights. Gentlemen of the jury, this man planned a robbery, 
Oh, pardon me, pardon me. I surely did not mean to insult your intelligence by saying, man, would you please forgive me for committing such an error? Gentlemen of the jury, now who would be hurt if you took this life? Look back to that second row. Please look. I want all 12 of you honorable men to turn your head and look back to that second row. What you see there has been everything to him, mama, grandmother, godmother, everything. Look at her, gentlemen of the jury, look at her well. You take this away from her and she has no reason to go on living. We may seem as not much, but he is her reason for existence. Think on that, gentlemen. Think on it. Gentlemen of the jury, be merciful. For God's sake, be merciful. He's innocent of all charges brought against him. But let us say he was not. Let us for a moment say he was not. What justice would there be to take this life? Justice, gentlemen. Why, I would just as soon put a hog in the electric chair as this. I thank you, gentlemen, from the bottom of my heart for your kind patience. I have no more to say except, except this. We must live with our own conscience. Each and every one of us must live with his own conscience. The jury retired and in return a verdict after lunch, guilty of robbery and murder in the first degree. The judge commended the 12 white men for reaching a quick and just verdict. This was Friday. He would pass sentence on Monday. 10 o'clock Monday, Miss Emma and my aunt sat in the same seats they had occupied on Friday. Reverend Moses Ambrose, the pastor of that church, was with them. He and my aunt sat on either side of Miss Emma. The judge, a short red-faced man with snow white hair and thick black eyebrows, asked Jefferson if he had anything to say before the sentencing. My aunt said that Jefferson was looking down at the floor and shook his head. The judge told Jefferson that he had been found guilty of the charges brought against him and that the judge saw no reason that he should not pay for the part he played in this horrible crime. Death by electrocution, the governor would set the date. Chapter two, a lesson before dying. When I came home from school that afternoon, I saw my aunt and Miss Emma sitting at the table in the kitchen. I was sorry now that I had come directly home because Miss Emma was the last person I wanted to see. Just like everyone else in the quarter, I knew what the sentence was going to be and I didn't want to have to look into her face. I hurried to my room with the satchel of papers that I had brought from school to work on that night. After laying the satchel on the table that I used as a desk, I sat down on the bed as quietly as I could. Neither my aunt nor Miss Emma had seen me come in, but they knew it was the time of day for me to be there. I tried to think of a way to make a quick appearance in the kitchen for courtesy's sake and then leave. I didn't want to look into that face any more than I had to. It was late October. And though I, was, I wore a wool shirt under my jacket, I was still a little cold. I thought how nice it would be to sit at the Rainbow Club in Bayonne. I had a lot of work to do, but I didn't feel like doing uh, being here, not as long as Miss Emma was in the house. I couldn't hear a sound from the kitchen. I wondered if I could sneak out of the house before my aunt saw me. I got up from the bed, and I was near the door when I heard footsteps in her bedroom. I hurried back to the table and took some papers out of the satchel. When she came into the room, I sat down at the table and was pretending to read. She stood looking at me. Ain't you going to speak to Miss Emma? She said. I was going to, I said. I was just looking over some papers. She wanted to talk to you. What about, I asked. She can tell you. I have to go to Bayon, Tondu, I said, something for the school. I'm sure this won't take all day, she said. The store closes at five, Tondu, I said. It's almost four now. 
You can spare a few minutes, my aunt said, especially today. She didn't say any more. She didn't have to. She was sure I knew what had happened. We looked at each other a moment, then I looked down at the student's paper that I had taken from the satchel. The fourth grade writing was nearly illegible, but even if it had been typed, I would not have been able to concentrate long enough to read it. My aunt, standing back watching me, knew I was not reading. I pushed the papers away and followed her through her room back into the kitchen. Miss Emma sat at the kitchen table, staring out into the yard. I started to speak to her, but I wasn't sure that she knew I was there. Sit down, Grant, my aunt said. I can stand, Tondu. Sit down, she said. She sat down first next to Miss Emma so that I would have to sit opposite both of them. And in this way, they could look at me at the same time or they could take turns. How are you, Miss Emma? I said. Making out, she said. She stared out into the yard. My aunt looked down at the table, and I waited, afraid to even think what Miss Emma might want to speak to me about. Miss Emma was in her early or mid-70s. My aunt was in her 70s, and I figured they were pretty much the same ages. Miss Emma's hair was gray and combed up and pinned on top. I had noticed her floppy brown felt hat and her overcoat on my aunt's bed on our way back into the kitchen. Her name was Emma Glenn, but no one except her closest friends and the white people on the river ever called anything but Miss Emma. Her husband, who was dead now, had called her Miss Emma, and she had called him Mr. Oscar. And that is how we on that plantation had grown up addressing them, except for Jefferson. He called her Nan, and he called Mr. Oscar Pare, Godmother and Godfather. Miss Emma continued to stare into the yard, but I was sure she was not seeing anything out there. There was nothing out there to see but the jimson weeds and the crabgrass and the rows of cane that ran parallel to the yard and about a hundred feet away from the kitchen where we sat. Miss Emma was not seeing any of that. She was remembering, she was thinking, but she was not seeing. Called him a hog. She said that and was quiet again. My aunt looked at me, then back down at the table. I waited. I know he was just trying to get him off, but they didn't pay that no mind. Still give him death. She turned her head slowly and looked directly at me. Her large, dark face showed all the pain she had gone through this day, this past weekend. No, the pain I saw in that face came from many, many years past. I don't want them to kill no hog, she said. I want a man to go to that chair on his own two feet. I waited, not knowing what was coming. But she was through talking. Now both she and my aunt looked at me as though I was supposed to figure out the rest of it. We stared at one another a few seconds before what they expected began to dawn on me. Wait, I said, wait. Neither one said a thing until I started to get up and my aunt told me to sit back down. Sit down for what? I asked her. So sit down, she said. I settled back on the chair, but not all the way back. I was ready to get up in the morning. He don't have to do it, as Emma said, looking beyond me again. Do what? I asked. You don't have to do it, she said again. It was dry, mechanical, and emotional, but I could tell by her face and by my aunt's face they were not about to give up on what they had in mind. What do you want me to do? I asked her, what can I do? It's only a matter of weeks, a couple of months, maybe. What can I do that you haven't done the past 21 years? You the teacher, she said. Oh yes, I'm the teacher, I said. And I teach all these white folks around here tell me to teach reading, writing, and arithmetic. They never told me how to keep a black boy out of a liquor store. You watch your tongue, sir. My aunt said. I sat back in the chair and looked at both of them. They sat there like bowlers, their bodies, their minds, immovable. He don't have to, Miss Emma said again. He gonna do it, my aunt said. Oh, I said. You gonna do it, she said. We're going up there and talk to Mr. Henri. And talk to Henri Pichot for what, 
I ask her. So you have the right to visit Jefferson. And what's our EP show got to do with that? His brother-in-law is the sheriff, ain't he? I waited for her to say more, but she did not. I got her from the table. And where do you think you're going? Tom Lowe asked me. To Bayonne where I can breathe, I said. I can't breathe here. You ain't going to know Bayonne until you go up the quarter, she said. You're going to, you're going to see Mr. Henri with me, am I there? I had walked away, but now I came back and leaned over the table toward both of them. Tom Lowe, Miss Emma, Jefferson is dead. It is only a matter of weeks, maybe a couple of months, but he's already dead. The past 21 years, we've done all we could for Jefferson. He's dead now, and I can't raise the dead. All I can do it is try to keep the others from re ending up like this. But he's gone from us. There's nothing I can do anymore, nothing any of us can do anymore. You going with us up the quarter, my aunt said. I go ahead and say the word. You're going up there with us, Brant, or you don't sleep in this house tonight. I stood back from the table and looked at both of them. I clapped my jaws so tight the bands in my neck felt as if they would burst. I wanted to scream at my aunt. I was screaming inside. I told her many, many times how much I hated this place, and all I wanted to do was get away. I told her I was no teacher. I hated teaching. I was just running in place here. But she had not heard me before, and I knew she, no matter how loud I screamed, she would not hear me now. I'm getting my coat, and I'll be ready to go, she said. Am I? Chapter three, a lesson before dying. My green 46 Ford was parked in front of the house. Tom Lou in her black overcoat and black rimless hat, and Miss Emma in her brown coat with the rabbit fur around the collar sleeves, her brown, floppy brown hat, followed me out to the car and stood back until I opened the door for them. Not only was I going to Don D. Pichot's house against my will, but I had to perform all the criticisms of chauffeur as well. After they had sat in the back seat, filling it up completely, I slammed the door and went around to the other side and got in. I could feel my aunt's eyes on the back of my neck for shutting the door as I did. Miss Anna probably would have looked at me the same way, but her mind was on other things. As I drove by the church where I taught school, I thought about all the work I had to do, and I reminded myself that I had to see one of the men on the plantation about getting a load of firewood for the heater. I tried to remember who had brought us the last wagon or the wood. Fifteen or twenty families sent their children to the school and always made it a point. They expected it of me to ask them to do something for the school during the six-month session. I would ask one of the older children to tell me who had brought in the last load of wood. I stopped at the side of the Army Pichot's large white and gray antebellum house. When my aunt started to get out of the car to open the gate for me, I told her to keep her seat because I had nothing to do all day but serve her. I felt her eyes on the back of my neck again, then on the side of my face as I pushed open the gate and on me directly as I came back to the car. After driving to the yard, I had to get out again to shut the gate. Now, since the side entrance led from the quarter to the house, Henri Pichot never used this, this gate. Only the tractors and the wagons and the trucks used this entrance, and over the many years, they cut just as many ruts across the yard. I must have hit every one of those ruts driving into the house. My aunt never said a thing, but I could feel her eyes on the back of my neck. I was not aiming for those ruts, but I wasn't avoiding them either. I could hear them bouncing in that back seat back there, but they never said a word. After parking under one of the great live oaks not far from the back door, I turned around and looked at my aunt. <clears throat> Am I supposed to go in there too? She looked at me, but she didn't answer me. She thought I'd hit those ruts on purpose. <clears throat> it was you who said you never wanted me to go through that back door ever again. Do I have to keep reminding you, Grant, this is not just another day? He don't have to go, Miss Emma said for about the hundredth time. She was looking at me, but not seeing me and not meaning what she was saying either. He's going, my aunt said. 
She was definitely seeing me. Mr. Henry won't come to him. Oh, yes. I keep forgetting that, I said. Mr. Henry won't come to me. <clears throat> After a minute of grunting and screaming, they were able to get out of the car. I followed them into the inner yard up the back stairs to the back door. <clears throat> the maid, Inez Lane, had seen us come into the yard, and she opened the door for us. Inez was in her early 40s, I suppose. She wore a white dress, white shoes, a blue gingham apron, and a kerchief on her head. She had a dark mold on her left cheek. She nodded to my aunt and me and spoke to Miss Emma. I heard, she said. I would like to speak to Mr. Henry if he's home, Miss Emma said. Talking to Mr. Lewis in the library, I near said. I'd like to speak to him if you don't mind, Miss Emma said. Inez nodded and left us. I looked around the kitchen. I had come into this kitchen many times as a small child to bring in wood for the stove, to bring in a chicken I had caught and killed, eggs I had found in the grass, figs, pears, and pecans I had gathered from the trees in the yard. Miss Emma was the cook up here then. She wore the white dress and the white shoes and the kerchief around her head. She had been here long before I was born, probably when my mother and father were children. She had cooked for the older P. Shows, the parents of Henri P. Show. She had cooked for Henri and his brother and sister, as well as for his nieces and nephews. He did not have any children of his own. She cooked, she ran the house. My aunt washed and ironed, and I ran through the yard to get the things they needed to cook or cook with. As a child growing up on that plantation, I could not imagine this place, this house, existing without the two of them in it. But before I left for the university, my aunt sat me down at the table in our, in our kitchen and said to me, now me and Emma can make out all right without you coming to that back door ever again. I had not come to that back door once since leaving for the university 10 years before. I had been teaching on the plays going on six years and I had not been in Pichot's yard let alone going up the back stairs or through that back door. I saw both my aunt and Miss Emma looking around the kitchen. Some things had changed since they left, others had not. <clears throat> the big black iron pot still hung against the wall, but the wood burning oven that I had known and that they had known had been exchanged for a gas range. <clears throat> and a big white refrigerator had taken the place of a smaller icebox. The war had changed all of that. After so many of the young colored men had gone into the military service or left the plantation, there was no one left to chop the wood and haul the ice. And when they left, so did the old people, my aunt and Miss Emma. I did not hear Inez knock on the library door or hear her call, but I did hear Avi Pichot's voice. Yes, Inez, what is it? Then a moment later, who? And a moment after that, did she say what she wanted? And later, go back there and ask her what she wants. Inez came back into the kitchen. Just tell him I'd like to speak to him, Miss Emma said. It's important. Inez started back at the hall, but Henri Pichot had already left the library. He was a medium-sized man of medium weight. He wore a gray suit, a white shirt, and a gray and white striped tie. He could have been in his mid-sixties. His hair was white and long. He held a drink. Louis Rougar, who followed him into the kitchen, was taller, heavier, and maybe a year or two younger. He wore a black pinstripe suit, and he also held a drink. Louis Rougar's people owned a bank in St. Adrian, a small town about 15 miles west of Henri Pichot's plantation. Mr. Henri, Mr. Louis, Miss Emma spoke to them. My aunt nodded. I didn't. I stood back near the door. What can I do for you, Emma? Pichot asked her. He seemed annoyed that he had been disturbed while he had company. I want to ask you a favor, Mr. Henry, Miss Emma said. He drank from his glass and looked at her. It's Jefferson, she said. Yes, I heard, he said, and waited. I want to ask you a favor. I can't change what has been handed down by the court, he said. I spoke up before the trial. I can't say any more. Yes, sir, she said. 
But that's not what I come to ask you for. I come to ask you something else. Miss Emma looked tired. She was tired. She wanted to sit down at the table, but no one had offered her a chair. My aunt put her arm around her shoulders to comfort her and to help her stand. I looked at the two white men who raised their glasses. I knew he should finish his drink and stuck out his hand. I asked me what that meant, and she came forward to get the empty glass. Then she turned to Louis Rugal, who stuck out his glass, emptied of everything except two or three small cubes of ice. She took the glasses to a liquor counter to refresh them their drinks. They call my boy a hog, Mr. Henry, as Emma said. I didn't raise no hog, and I don't want no hog to go sit in that chair. I want a man to go sit in that chair, Mr. Henry. He looked at her, but he didn't say anything. He was waiting for his drink. I'm old, Mr. Henry, she went on. Jefferson gonna need me, but I'm too old to be going up there. <clears throat> My heart won't take it. I want you to talk to the sheriff for me. I want somebody else to take my place. That's up to you, Mr. Sam, isn't it? Picho said, and he took the drink off the tray that I has held before him. I need you to speak for me, Mr. Henry, Miss Emma said. I want the teacher to visit my boy. I want the teacher to make him know he's not a hog, he's a man. I want to know that before he go to that chair, Mr. Henry. Henry Picho glanced at me, then looked back at her. Now, I done done a lot for this family and this place, Miss Donnelly, she said. All I'm asking you, talk to the sheriff for me. I done done a lot for this family over the years. I can't promise you anything, he said, and sipped his drink. You can speak to your brother-in-law and say what? I want the teacher to talk to my boy for me. He looked over her head at me standing back by the door. I was too educated for Henry P. Show. He had no use for me at all anymore. But just as Miss Emma had given so much of herself to that family, so had my aunt. So Henry Pichel, who cared nothing in the world for me, tolerated me because of my aunt. And what do you plan to do, he asked me. I shook my head. I have no idea. He stared at me, and I realized that I had not answered him in the proper manner. Sir, I added. You think you can change him from a hog to a man in the little time he's got left? I have no idea, sir, I said. But you're willing to try if I get Mr. Sam and let you come up there? Well, that's what she wants, sir. But you didn't put up to this. No, sir, I did not, I said. He was through talking to me. Now he wanted me to look away. I lowered my eyes. When I raised my head, I saw his eyes on her again. I would forget all of this if I were you, he said. Let Mose visit him and keep it at that. Reverend Mose will visit him, Miss Emma said. But no, sir, I won't keep it at that. At this point, I would be more concerned about his soul if I were you, Henri said. Yes, sir, I'm concerned for his soul, Mr. Henri, Miss Emma said. I'm concerned for his soul, but I want him to be a man too when you go to that chair. Louis Rubin, standing next to Henri Pichot, held his drink without drinking. He could not believe what he was hearing here. Henri Pichot looked at me again. He was sure I had put her up to this. I shifted my eyes and looked in the, and I shifted my eyes, and I didn't look in his direction until I heard him speaking to her. Go on home, forget all this foolishness, he told her. You've done all you could to raise him. Let the law have him now. The law got him, Mr. Henri, Ms. Simmer said, and they're going to kill him but let them kill a man. Let the teacher go to him, Mr. Henry. I done done a lot for this family over the years. I know what you've done for this family over the years, he told her, and also know what he did, or have you forgotten that? I ain't forgotten nothing, Mr. Henry, she said. I know what they say he did. He did it, Henry said, leaving no doubt in his mind. I spoke for him because of you, but all the time I knew he did it. If you say so, Mr. Henry, I say so, he said. But that's not what I come up here for, Mr. Henry, Miss Emma said to him. I'm not begging for his life no more. That's over. I just want to see him die like a man. This family owe me that much, Mr. Henry, and I want it. I want somebody to do something for me one time before I close my eyes. 
Somebody had to do something for me one time before I closed my eyes and started to be pleased. From where I stood back by the door, I could see my aunt tightening her grip around Miss Emma's shoulder to give her comfort. I'll speak to him, Henry said, but it's up to him, not me. Tell him what I done done for this family, Mr. Henry. Tell him to ask his wife all I done done for this family over the years. I said I would speak to him, Henry said, obviously becoming more and more impatient with her. When, she asked. Henry Fischer had started to raise his glass, but because for him the conversation was over. But when Miss Emma spoke again, his hand stopped inches away from his mouth and he lowered the glass. What? When? Whenever I see him, that's when, he said. Now, if you don't mind, I have a guest. He, dr he drank and turned away. Mr. Henry, Miss Emma called him, but he kept walking. I'll be up here again tomorrow, Mr. Henry. I'll be on my knees next time you see me, Mr. Henry. But she was speaking to empty space. Henri Pichot and Louis Rougon were right in the library. Miss Emma continued to stare at the hall for a moment. Then she and my aunt turned away and I held the door open for them to go outside. The sun had gone down, and it was getting colder. One more chapter. Chapter four, A Lesson Before Dying. I took them back down the quarter. <clears throat> when I stopped in front of Miss Emma's house, my aunt got out of the car with her. I'm going to be young, I told my aunt. She had not shut the door yet. I'll be home to cook in a little while, she said. I'll eat in town, I told her. Talu held the door while she stood there looking at me. Nothing could have hurt her more when I said I was not going to eat her food. I was supposed to eat soon after she had cooked, and if I was not at home, I was supposed to eat as soon as I came in. She looked at me without saying anything else. Then she closed the door quietly, and followed Miss Emma to the yard. I turned the car around and started at the quarter again. There was not a single telephone in the quarter, not a public telephone anywhere that I could use before reaching Bayon, and Bayon was 13 miles away. After leaving the quarter, I drove down a gravel road for about two miles, then along a paved road beside the St. Charles River for another 10 miles. There were houses and big live oak and pecan trees on either side of the road, but not as many on the riverbank side. There, instead of houses and trees, there were fishing wharves, boat docks, nightclubs, and restaurants for whites. There were one or two nightclubs for color, but they were not very good ones. As I drove along the river, I thought about all the schoolwork that I should have been doing at home, but I knew that after being around Miss Emma and Anu Pichot the past hour, I would not have been able to concentrate on my work. I needed to be with someone. I needed to be with Gideon. Bayan was a small town of about 6,000, approximately 3,500 whites, approximately 2,500 colored. It was the parish seat for St. Raphael. The courthouse was there, so was the jail. There was a Catholic church of town for whites, Catholic church back of town for colored. There was a white movie theater uptown, colored movie theater back of town. There were two elementary schools uptown, one Catholic, one public for whites, and the same back of town for color. Beyond's major industries were a cement plant, a sawmill, and a slaughterhouse, mostly for hogs. There was only one main street in Beyond, and it ran along the St. Charles River. The department stores, the banks, the two or three dentists and doctors and attorney's office, was more, mostly on this street, which made up less than half a dozen blocks. <clears throat> After entering the town, which is marked by the movie theater for whites on the riverbank side of the road, I had to drive another two or three blocks before turning down an unlit road which led back of town to the colored section. Once I crossed the, the railroad tracks, I could see the Rainbow Club with its green, yellow, red, off neon lights. Several cars were parked before the door, one of them a big white new 48 Cadillac belonged to Joe Claiborne, who owned the place. A man and a woman came through the door as I got out of my car to go inside. There were probably a dozen people in the place, half of them at the bar, the rest of them sitting at tables with white tablecloth. I spoke to Joe Claiborne and went through a side door into the cafe to use the telephone. 
The tables in the cafe had checkered red and white tablecloths. Thelma played on us behind the counter. Thelma ran the cafe and her husband Joe ran the bar. I asked her what she had for supper. Smothered chicken, smothered beef steak, shrimp stew, she said. There was only one other person in the cafe and he sat at the counter eating the sh uh, stewed shrimps. The shrimps any good? I asked Thelma. All my food's good, she said. Shrimps, I said. While Thelma dished up my food, I went to the telephone in the corner by the toilet. It took giving a while to answer, and she didn't sound too happy about it. Did I get you at a bad time, I asked her. Get these children something to eat, she said. Where are you? The Rainbow Club, I said. Tonight? I need to see you, baby. I need to talk, I said. Is something the matter? I just need to talk to you, baby, that's all. You want to come over here? I, can't fix, I can fix you a sandwich. No, I'm going to eat here at the cafe. I'll see if I can get Dora, she said. If I can't, you'll have to come here. We're here. I can't leave the children alone. I understand, she said. Thelma had the stewed shrimps, a green salad of lettuce, tomato and cucumber, a piece of cornbread, and a glass of water on the counter waiting for me. Anything to go with that, she asked. Oh, this will do. Here are a table, she asked. Count is good. What you doing in town on Monday, she asked, calling this fine brown. I nodded. Biggest, Thelma said and smiled. Thelma's mouth was full of gold teeth, solid gold as well as gold crown. She also wore some perfume that was strong enough to keep you a good distance away from her. I figured that's where most of that money went on that, those gold teeth, that perfume, and payment on that new white Cadillac that Joe had parked for the door. But they were good people, both of them. When I was broke, I could always get a meal and pay later. And the same went for the bar. <clears throat> I talked with Thelma a while, uh, a while after I finished eating, then I paid her and went back to the other side. The usual, Clayborn asked me. He knew what I drank, but he would always ask. I nodded. What you doing here on Monday? He asked, I'll pour me a brandy. Well, I need to drink. Oh, sure, he said. He pulled a glass of ice water and set it on the bar beside the brandy. I think I know now, he said. Car lights had just flashed up on the front of the club, and I could hear the tires on the crushed seashells just right at the door, and sure enough, it was Vivian, and the men at the bar looked around at her when she came in. She was quite tall, five, seven, five, eight, and she wore a green wool sweater, a green and brown plaid skirt, and both fit her very well. She had soft, light brown skin and high cheekbones and greenish brown eyes, and her nostril and lips showed some thickness, but not much. Her hair was long and black, and she kept it twisted into a bun and pin at the back of her head. Vivian Baptiste was a beautiful woman, and she knew it, but she didn't flaunt it. It was just there. She came up to me, and a couple of the other men at the bar nodded and spoke to her. One tipped his hat and called her Miss Lady. So you made it, he said. I got Dora. Usual? Clayborn asked her. She nodded to pour my drink. Well, Shirley can bring it to your table, Clayborn said. It won't tire out too much, I hope, I said. Clayborn grunted. It was a slow night. The few people at the bar were holding onto their glasses and not buying any more. Shirley, the waitress, was sitting on a bar stool at the far end, and she had not moved once since I'd been there. Even and I went over to a table far over into the corner where we could be alone. I'm glad you came, I said, and kissed her. Shirley brought the drinks and set them before us on paper napkins. Before leaving, she looked at me out of the corner of her eye to let me know she didn't like my remarks at the bar. Even and I touched glasses. What is the matter, Grant? She asked me. I just had to see you. Is something the matter? When was the last time I told you I loved you? Oh, about a second ago. I should say it more often, I said. What is the matter, Grant? She asked me again. You want to leave from here tonight? I asked her. You want to go home and pack your clothes and get the children and leave from here tonight? She looked at me as though she was trying to figure out whether I was serious or not. No, she said. Why not? I asked her. Because the whole thing is just too crazy, she said. People do it all the time. They just pack and leave. Some people can, but we can't, she said. We're teachers and we have a commitment. Oh, you hit the nail on the head there, lady. Commitment. Commitment to what? To live and die in this hellhole when we can leave 
and live like other people. How much have you had to drink tonight, Grant? A whole excess barrel of commitment, I said, and raised my glass. Do you want me to leave, Grant? She asked me. You know, I don't like it when you talk like that. No, I don't want you to leave. Please don't leave me, I told her. She reached over and touched my hand. Then she began to rub the knuckles with her finger. I need to go someplace where I can feel I'm living, I said. I don't want to spend the rest of my life teaching school in a plantation church. I want to be with you someplace where we could have a choice of things to do. I don't feel alive here. I'm not living here. I know we can do better someplace else. I'm still married, he said. A separation is not a divorce. I can't go anywhere until all of this is over with. That's not the word keeping you here. Even after the divorce, you'll still feel committed, I said. And you, Grant? I'm tired of feeling committed. Then why haven't you gone? Because of you, I said. That's not true, Grant, you know it, she said. We met only three years ago. I was still married. I was pregnant with my second child. You told me then how much you always wanted to get away. And you did once, remember? You went to California to visit your mother and father, but you wouldn't stay. You couldn't stay. You had to come back. Why did you come back, Grant? Why? Well, I want to go now, and I want you to go with me, he said. I'm still married, Grant. After the divorce? She nodded. After the divorce, I'll do whatever you want me to do, as long as you're responsible for what you do. In other words, if I fail, I would have to blame myself the rest of my life for trying. Is that it? I'll leave all that up to you, Grant. You still want me after the divorce. I'll always want you, I said, and touched her hand. And if you don't know, don't know that by now, I don't know what you do know about me. A couple from one of the other tables had gotten up and chosen a record on the jukebox. It was a blues, the tempo slow, and the two people danced close together. I needed Vivian closer to me than she was now, and I asked if she wanted to dance. We left the table, and I took in my arms, and I could feel her breast through the sweater, and I could feel her thighs through the plaid skirt, and I felt very good. We danced for a while. I didn't want to say it, but I had to say it. He gave him death, I said. She and I had talked about it on the weekend, and I did not want to talk about it now, or even think about it now, but it was the only thing that stayed on my mind. I could feel her body go tense against me. We danced a while. They want me to visit him, I said. That would be nice, Frank. They want me to make him a man before he dies, I said. She stopped dancing, and she stood back to look at me. Her face was twisted into a painful, questioning frown. That public defender trying to get him off called him a dumb animal, I told her. He said it would be like tying a hog down in an electric chair and executing him, an animal that didn't know what any of it was all about. The jury, 12 white men, good and true, still sentenced him to death. Now his godmother wants me to visit him and make him know, prove to these white men that he's not a hog. He's a man. I'm supposed to make him a man. Who am I? God? The record ended, and we went back to our table. <clears throat> I still don't know if that sheriff would ever let me, even let me come up there. And suppose he did. What then? What do I say to him? Do I know what a man is? Do I know a man is supposed to die? Still trying to find out how a man should live. Am I supposed to tell someone how to die who has never lived? Give him the water, hit it. Suppose I was allowed to visit him. And suppose I reached him and made him realize that he was as much man as any other man. Then what? He's still going to die. The next day, the next week, the next month. So what will I have accomplished? What will I have done? Why not let the hog die without knowing anything? Vivian raised her head to look at me and she was crying. I took one of my hand and both of mine. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do this to you. I don't want to do this to you. I just didn't know where else to turn. I want you to always come to me, Grant, she said. I want you to always come to me. Shirley walked over to the table to pick up our empty glasses. Y'all want anything more, she asked. Oh, another round, I told her, and she left. I want you to go up there, Vivian said. If they make those decisions, sweetheart, I don't. If they say yes, I want you to go for me. For you? For us, Grant. 
I looked at her and she looked back at me and she had meant what she said. I don't know if I can take it. I said, I really don't. I know you can. I'll need you every moment, I said. I'll be here. Shirley came back with the drinks and set them on clean, dry paper napkins. She looked at me again that same way to let me know she didn't like my remarks at the bar earlier. Shirley was still mad, didn't say it after she had gone. Oh, I'll leave a good tip, I said. Even raised a glass to me and smiled. You have the most beautiful smile, I said. She smiled again. What are you doing this weekend? I asked her. Homework, housework, what else? <clears throat> Would you like to go to bed, uh, Baton Rouge one night? Friday or Saturday, I'll pay Dora. <clears throat> Friday sounds good, she said. We had friends in Baton Rouge who knew about her pending divorce and knew about my aunt, and they let us stay a while at that place while they went out to a bar. Sometimes we would join them at the bar later, other times, we just leave the key in an envelope with a thank you note. But we were both getting very tired of that. We touched glasses and finished our drinks, then we left. Thank you very much. Show, um, to show two uh, men, um, one um, teacher in 1948, and what he was allowed to teach and what he could not teach, and uh, to show another person who um, had not given any education at all, and how these two people would have to come together and how they would. Uh, teach each other to live. Uh, Grant would teach Jefferson to live. It was only for a week or two weeks or a month. Jefferson would teach Grant to live for 50 years or a little bit long. So when they come together, Grant as teacher is to teach Jefferson how to face death. But they teach him to live for a moment before facing death, and then Jefferson in turn teaches Grant how to live 50 years so he could go back and really become a teacher. Something like that. Any other questions? Don't be shy, I won't be here tomorrow. <laughs> and I won't know the answer. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, that's one. Yeah. That's a good point. By the time I got the Genesis's diary, I had um been with him for about five years. And that is, I had been writing on the book for about five, <clears throat> not five complete years, because I teach uh, at the University of Southwestern Louisiana, but I teach in the fall, and uh, I would write in the spring and the summers. And it took me about seven years to spring, only the spring and the summer to write the book. But by the time I came to the diary, I had been with, um, with the book about, about five or six years. So by then I'd gotten to know Jefferson just as I'd gotten to know Grant and Tom Lou and Miss Emma and all the rest of them. I got to know him very well. Uh, and uh, I uh, also had the help of people like James Joyce and uh, Faulkner. <laughs> For those of you who don't know the diary, it's, uh, uh, Jefferson, of course, is illiterate. And uh, he writes this diary. He's trying to say, Grant wants him to say something about himself because he won't talk to anybody. He said, well, I'll leave this little uh, tablet here with you, notebook with you, and he writes anything that you want to write, anytime you want to write it. And Jefferson writes in the, in the, in the uh, paper, and he does not use punctuation marks or um, capitalizing things, and he can't spell, and, but he, he does reveal his soul in, the, in this little diary. And uh, that's what that's about. Yes, sir. Um, the teacher, uh, did you intend for the teacher also to learn from the ministry? 
Yeah. Yeah, right, yeah. Well, I didn't intend for her to teach her to learn from because the teacher was still bitter at that time. But by the time it comes to who will go to that, that jail that day, the teacher realizes that this man is you know, a little bit braver than I am. And he does learn what bravery is, what courage is from this man at the time. That he would have not even have the courage to go there. So he does learn. Everyone gets some. I hope it's a lesson that all of them get something from. Well, that's what I meant. <clears throat> the minister actually gave them a lesson on education. Well, he wasn't educated. Well, 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 I can understand what the minister is saying, but Grant could not understand what he was saying at that time. And the minister is saying, listen, you didn't go to school. All that I learned how to teach reading, writing, and arithmetic. You went to school. Uh, we, you know, you have to learn how to lie now. And when people are suffering, you have to lie and tell them that they, they you know, try to do something about it. And because we all lie, they just say, I lie. I lie every, almost every baptism, every funeral, every, every Christmas. I keep lying. But I lie for a purpose, you know. I lie for a purpose. There's another point that you took an unusual twist on normally when a black is meant or a simply electric spirit. That's an event. However, you tend to the city, and the chair the city, that it is horrible. It is horrible for even the people that announce this sentence. You know, the lady who's going to say this thing. That's unusual. Reading a soldier in that period. Huh? Mm-hmm. Usually, you know, there's a big barbecue when there's something. You, you know what I'm saying? You're not curious. Yeah, well, I was not interested in those who want to barbecue. I wanted to have a bunch of others. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 well, I, oh, no, no, but well, I'm, I'm, I'm quite unusual. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, sir, that was a good point. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, Yeah. 
Teacher, and uh, that's a good question. That's a good question, anyway. Uh, in San Francisco State in 1955, I think I've been out of the United States, and uh, I was taking a class titled Expository Writing 110, and it was like uh, essays. And uh, of course, you know, I didn't read and read and read, I didn't read and read and read and read and read and read and read. So uh, I told him, I said, look, I said, let me try my hand.